My guest today is an entrepreneur, an international speaker, and a best-selling author. I hope you'll enjoy today's conversation with me and Daniel Priestley. I didn't have a word for entrepreneurship, but this was my first experience of, of like something bad happened in the world, this fire. And then I turned it into something good and productive and positive. The fire didn't hurt anyone, but it damaged all this stuff. And I had this idea that I'm going to clean up all the stuff and I'm going to lay it out in a garage sale. I want to use the tools of entrepreneurship to solve the world's most meaningful problems. you got to move towards meaning. you got to move towards speed. And you got to move towards being part of a smaller, more dynamic entrepreneurial company. I have to take notes when I'm talking to you. <laughs> There's actually a, a great profound joy and happiness and release in knowing that I'm just part of a tapestry, that we are all part of this incredible game Welcome back. My guest today is Daniel Priestley. Uh, Daniel is the is a, a an entrepreneur, an international speaker, and a best-selling author. Uh, he started from scratch and built a multi-million uh, dollar business that spans from Australia to Singapore to the UK. And uh, he wrote uh, four best-selling uh, books: uh, Key Person of Influence, uh, Entrepreneur Revolution, Twenty Four Assets and oversubscribed, which uh, basically teach entrepreneurs how to build businesses uh, that are successful in a world uh, that is constantly changing. Uh, Daniel was uh, named in the top 10 business advisors in the UK uh, by Enterprise Nation, and he uh, is one of the top 25 entrepreneurs in London in the Smith and Williamson uh, Power 100 Awards. Uh, I regularly try to vary the topics that we have here uh, on Slow Mo. Uh, it's always an invitation to slow down and think about how you can reshape your life in ways uh, that are uh, important and successful for you. And I think in a time where there is so much change and so much happening perhaps to jobs, it might not be a bad idea to start learning about how we can create our own uh, success, our own businesses. Uh, in a fast-changing world. So I hope you'll enjoy today's conversation with me and Daniel uh, Priestley. Daniel, thank you so much for joining me. Mo, what a pleasure. Uh, it's been, uh, it's been what, uh, six, seven weeks since uh, we started uh, to set this up. I apologize it took so long. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad we got here. Um, we've got some wonderful friends in common. Oh, do, uh, Spencer yeah. Lodge. No way. Uh, Steve, Steve Bolton. Oh, Steve. Oh, my God. I love Steve so much. <laughs> One of my favorite conversations ever on Slow Mo. H how do you know him? Yeah. Steve, Steve has been a great friend of mine for 16 years, 17 years. You lucky bastard. <laughs> <laughs> do you live in the same place? Um, and Ali Abdal. Oh, Ali is, uh, yeah. Oh, come on. So why, how come we have not met? Yeah, and, uh, and Simon Alexander Ong. Oh, Simon. So amazing. you and Simon, I... Simon introduced us, actually. So, yeah. Ah, fantastic. So you and I have got all these incredible friends in common. Yes. Uh, I mean, you, 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 you start uh, uh, with Spencer and say, wonderful. I'm like, okay, uh, Spence, wonderful. Uh, no, actually, he is. He was the guest on the podcast, and you know, you know of his human trafficking project, right? Uh, so he 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 recently went to. He, it's not out yet, but he went and did a documentary. Truly risked his life, actually. It's an issue that's really coming coming up a lot uh, lately. So it it's is. It's, it is it's always been an issue. I think we've recently started to bring it to the to the front. You know, to the to the light. Yeah, uh, it's not something. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, some, most of the comments that I got, got on that episode was, "How can I accept to live in a world uh, that's doing this to innocent humans?" And you know, it is quite interesting that we have so many disciplines in the world, so many interests, so many topics to cover. That something so, I mean unjust in every possible way can go I think it's too un... painful for people yeah you think so yeah so they don't yeah. want to talk about it yeah it's too it's too painful it's uh it's too too overwhelming it's interesting what we've seen this week with 
everyone jumping ship on Twitter and joining threads. It's it's really taught me that people don't want to be confronted with the with the ups and downs of the world. They just want to have uh, you know uh, surface level conversations. Pre- you know things that make them feel good. Don't, don't, um, don't, don't say everyone. Want... I I didn't, and I will not. Yeah, yeah. So a lot, well, a lot of like a hundred million people have, I've been looking at a lot of the conversations on threads and a lot of the conversations are, gee, this is so much nicer than Twitter. I don't have to listen to all the, all the, you know, horrible things in the world. Yeah. Um, ah, that's an so, interesting yeah, thing. It's a painful so topic. You, you, th- you think by, uh, by, by removing the pain, it becomes a more interesting platform. I think it becomes, uh, a more dopamine inducing platform. <laughs> uh, I would agree to that, actually. I, I, I question, though, if it will remain such uh, in the long no, term. No, because Twitter was exactly like that in the first couple of years. It was all, all very positive. Yeah, sadly, sadly, this is what we, uh, this is what we crave as humans. You know, we're craving that negativity all the time somehow. You're not that kind of guy, though. You're completely full of positivity. So. Uh, you know, I, I have to say I followed your work. I didn't know about you until, uh, um, uh, you know, we were introduced. Uh, and I, um, and I uh, you know, followed your uh, Instagram. Uh, very, uh, very solid advice. No uh, fluffy stuff, right? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm glad. Yeah. So, so, so the, in, it, let's, let's get, introduce you to our audience first. So you're... Uh, you're an entrepreneur, you started the business, and uh, then you helped other businesses for quite some time now. Uh, and, uh, and, and you wrote books about business. So you, your life centered around this, but you were not born in a business family. You didn't come from a, a, a business start at all, did you? No, my mum uh, was a journalist um, through the real peak of journalism and newspaper success and all of those sorts of things in the eighties and the nineties. Um, and my dad was a school teacher and I used to go to school with dad. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, while I was growing up, I would always go to the same school dad was a teacher at. So spent a lot of time around mum telling stories and, and being a journalist and dad, uh, being a teacher. And when, when did that shift in your mind? Like, why did you start a business? Why didn't you just become a teacher? <laughs> well, you know, we all have these experiences as kids that kind of shape our our reality. I've I've spoken to thousands of entrepreneurs, and there seems to be something that happened to them at around age ten that um, that kind of almost is a is a moment, a spark of um, yeah. I've I've noticed this as a bit of a common theme. So for me, what happened was um, my mother was cooking uh, French fries in the kitchen. And there was a uh, the the oil leapt up onto the curtains and set fire to the curtains, oh, wow. and the house filled up with smoke. Mm-hmm. And um, what happened is that it damaged all this stuff in the house. The fire didn't hurt anyone, but it damaged all this stuff. <clears throat> and I had this idea, this brainwave at age ten, that I'm going to clean up all the stuff and I'm going to lay it out in a garage sale uh, format and I'm going to sell it. And um, I go to the next door neighbors and I get them to put all their stuff in my garage sale and I keep a journal of all the things that I'm selling and how much we're going to sell them for. Um, and I, at 10, I coordinate this thing with our neighbors and I put this garage sale on. Wow. And yeah, and it was like 50-50 joint ventures. I didn't even know how I came up with this, but I negotiated 50-50 that if I sell this, I remember there was a baby car seat if I sell the baby car seat, I get half and you get half. <laughs> so somehow I managed to do this. And there was this magical moment, uh, Mo, where this this uh, guy comes up to me and he wants me to negotiate on the microwave. And he says, um, uh, how much for the microwave? And I say, $20. $20. And he says, uh, can I talk to your dad? Uh, oh, goodness, I've said the wrong thing. So dad comes out and uh, dad says, um, what's the issue? And he says, well, can I pay $10 for the microwave, not 20 and my dad looks at this guy, and I can picture the look on dad's face when he does this. He says, well, it's my son's business. You've got to negotiate with him. <laughs> and he just turns Good around dad. and walks away. <laughs> right? So I'm, st- I'm left standing there with this adult, and, and I say, well, it's $20. And he pays $20. <laughs> and um, 
and I, I, you know, you know, this is the, this is like one of those highs in the world where, what? I can do that. I can generate ten dollars out of thin air. You know, the, the... It, it was exactly that. It yeah. was this magical moment. You know, it was the separation of I'm different. I'm I'm a separate individual to my family. Up until that point, I'm dependent and reliant upon mum and dad for yeah. my survival. And then at that point, it was I can do stuff on my own. I'm ex- I I could go. You know, I can I can create stuff. I can make money. I can do this stuff. Uh, two two things that was strange happened around that, which is number one, we went and bought a I bought a BMX bike and a Sega Master System with the proceeds. Mm. So I felt on top of the world, right? <laughs> like two two Rolls Royces. All right. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I I buy this stuff and I feel incredible. And then also strangely, Mum made this silly offhand comment um, when she saw all the cash that I had. She was joking and she said, oh, you've got more money than us now. And as a kid, I know she was joking, but as a kid, my brain went, whoa. Yeah. That's all. That's all. I just had one idea. Now I have more money than mum and dad. Whoa. So Mm. I remember this kind of weird experience around that. So this was my first, I didn't have a word for entrepreneurship, but this was my first experience of, of like something bad happened in the world, this fire. And then I turned it into something good and productive and positive. And it was like the the narrative for me as a kid was, wow, this this activity was a bad thing and now it's a good thing. And how like how incredible was this? That that is actually so so you you're getting me to think of what happened in my life because I think it was around the same time. Uh, I, I I don't know if I could ever call my biggest passion entrepreneurship, but I definitely have been a maker and a maker, you know, not necessarily making for money and the business cycle, but I just loved making things. And I think, you know, of course, it, it, you have roots of that as a younger child. So, you know, my 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 parents would buy me Meccano if you never if you remember that, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, no, and, well. And uh, and then I had a tiny little carpentry kit when I was a child, and you know, but but I remember that something happened in my uh, teens, and the first instance I remember was the World Cup event that was in Italy, uh, mm-hmm. if if you remember that, and. I must have been 14 or something, and the mascot of that World Cup was a sort of a stick figure with the colors of the flag, uh, or the Italian flag on it. And, and I decided to go out <coughs> in the market and buy sticks of wood, cut them to size, and you know, stick them together in the same shape of that uh, mascot, and put a ping pong ball on top, and literally stand in the traffic light next to our home to sell them, okay? I, wow. I have to admit openly, I sold very few, and I I drilled through my uh, my finger uh, in the process, and I made very little money. Uh, but I completely was over the moon with the ability of. How old do you think you were? We can find out. I mean, if World Cups are every four years, uh, then you probably could say seventy eight. I may have been nine or uh, eighty-two. Yeah, or yeah, or eighty-two, nine, fifteen, something like that. Uh, so yeah. you know, t- t- eleven, fifteen, something like that. So the reason I ask is, is I've I've interviewed thousands of entrepreneurs. Um, for my accelerator program, we have an interview process, and we interview and we do this thing called Origin, Mission, and Vision. So Origin is who are you and why did you start your business? Mission is like what do you think is your most high value activities that you do. And vision is what do you want to see happen in the world? Mm. And uh, so we do this session called an OMB session. And what we've discovered is that behind every startup uh, entrepreneur around age 10 is this moment of empowerment. There is some sort of a moment that has ingredients in the story. Mm. Um, and it's almost like <clears throat> I've, I've, I'm not a psychologist or I've never even studied any <laughs> anything psychology, psychology related much. but I've just noticed this recurring theme that around age 10, people have a experience that sets them up for a set of almost like a perfect storm of circumstances that they want to recreate in the rest of their life. They want to do it again and again and again, but at different scales with different characters. 
I mean, if yeah. so, so I just searched. It's, it was 1990, which means I was 12, 13, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, it wasn't that moment where I started. This was the moment that basically I put, put it in action. So it might be around age 10. But this kind of discovery, I mean, if, if it is, then ev every parent should almost simulate those experiences. Maybe, <laughs> I mean, we normally talk about the operating system uh, stage, you know, the first three to four years of a, a, a child's life being so important because they set up their um, understanding of love and, you know, feeling safe and uh, language and all of that. But then, you know, if that event at at, a, at 10 is important, then I think perhaps parents need to start bombarding their kids with experiences other than uh, scoring an A in math and, you know, going to tennis and, and doing the stuff that we force them to do, but rather allow them to be become who they are. Well, there's an, there's an interesting element to this story, which is that it always has to be a moment where you break away from the family. Oh, that you do something, you have to do it on your own. So, and I'm look. I'm as I say, I'm not. I'm only someone who's observed this in in in, in talking to thousands of entrepreneurs. But I'm not. I've not conducted any scientific studies on this. But it's it's always a moment where I went out on my own. It's a moment of individuality. So I think up until age ten, we see ourselves as a completely coherent part of a family. That there is there is just the family dynamic. That's the that's. That's what we exist within. Mm. And then around age 10, we have a moment where it's our time to prove ourselves as an individual. And I see this story come up and come up and like, and it comes up. And it, like in your story, you saw something on mass media. So there's part of like when I decode it, there's part of the ingredient is something is happening globally. There is a mm. global thing happening. And I'm going to take a piece of it. I'm going to take something that's digital and I'm going to physical anthropomorphize it. I'm going to, um, you know, craft it. I'm going to do something physical with this. Uh, um, and if we look at your career with like Google and, um, and you know, a billion people happy and all this sort of stuff, and also now your conversations around AI, it's this idea that something big is happening in the world. There's a global mm -hmm. trend. There's a mm -hmm. global movement. And how do, we, how do we respond to that? How do we like that's make it real for people? At an individual level, in a very interesting way, I, you know, I, I, I think it was my. We we're supposed to be talking about you, not about me. But I, I, you just <laughs> got me thinking because I, I have to say, you know, there were many, many identities in life that I assumed. Okay, uh, sort of like thinking to myself, I'm an entrepreneur, or thinking to myself, I'm a software uh, developer or an engineer, and so on. And, you know, most of them were true. They were part of what I was at the time, but they were really, truly not who I am in, in, in its entirety. And, and I don't remember who, but, you know, someone, uh, you know, maybe 10, 12 years ago, someone asked me and said, describe yourself in one word. And it was super clear. If it had to go down to one word, it would be maker. It would be someone who just takes nothing and turns it into something, okay? Or takes some things and turn them into other things. And once I got that, I will tell you, hands down, my life became super clear, okay? It's, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it is so simple when you think about it, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And, well, there's a, there's a second ingredient to it, which is you're a maker, but you take massive trends that are happening globally, yeah. which is the World Cup, right? The World Cup at the time was the biggest thing you'd ever seen. Right, so this biggest massive thing that millions of people, maybe even a billion people, are engaged in, and then you're making it, you're doing something with it to make it deeply personal, and you're mm. you're using your hands to make it. You're translating it from this massive global phenomenon into something that people can tangibly touch. Yeah. Now, when I think about what you do now, you take things that are massive global phenomenons. And, I make and you it make very it deeply personal, personal for people. I, that's true, actually. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, Through I mean, your my, making. My, my life entirely now is around the idea of making AI uh, your deeply topic. Your, yeah, it's yeah. every individual's uh, experience, every individual's life uh, is affected by it. So if, what, if I asked you to describe yourself in one word, what would that be? <laughs> well, the, the theme that came out for me is that I love... Um, the power of entrepreneurship to turn something negative into a positive. I like entrepreneurs who solve meaningful problems. I love, I love the entrepreneurial process 
that identifies a problem transforms it into a scalable opportunity. And that to me is the one, one of the most exciting ideas that I keep coming back to. And it's this idea that the people who have the best mindset for solving the world's most meaningful problems are entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs, they see a problem and they say, hey, there's an opportunity to solve this in a scalable way and to transform this. And they get excited when they see problems. But what does the word mean? Because we, we, we throw it around all the time, entrepreneur, entrepreneur. But, you know, mm. what, what, we, we growing up, I, I think people will laugh at this, but growing up, I am an old man. There was a, a, a moment in history where this word was not part of our dictionary at all. We did, we, I think I started to hear it uh, maybe in the 90s, but that's because English is not my native language. But I'm sure it wasn't available in the 80s or the 70s. We called them other things. We called them business, business owners. Business owner, yeah. businessman. Yeah. yeah. So what does it mean? What, it, what is an entrepreneur? So you're doing a few different things. You are taking a personal risk. So part of it is risk-taking. Um, and it has to be risk-taking that it could actually turn out badly for you. So it could damage reputation, it could damage your finances, it could be a huge waste of time. Um, so one element is one of the ingredients that you throw into the bowl is personal risk taking. Um, the next element that you take in is the idea of commercial success, that you're solving a problem to make money, that you're solving a problem because you want to see a commercial solution, a commercial success. You, you're using the tools of capitalism. Um, and then the third element is that you're organizing resources beyond your control. So you don't have the resources to do this. You have to organize other people's resources. Now, if you take away any of those elements, it's not really entrepreneurship. So if you're just simply taking a risk and you're um, trying to be successful, but you're not organizing anyone else's resources, then you're essentially an asset manager. You're managing assets that you're, you're a money manager or an asset manager. Yeah. Um, because you've already got the resources. Um, if you're uh, uh, trying to make money and you're organizing someone else's resources, but you're not taking personal risk, you're a leader. Um, that's great. You're a business leader, but you're not an entrepreneur. So you need all three of these elements to go together in order to get this entrepreneurial thing uh, happening. And, and the secret ingredient that I love in the modern world is this idea that Entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs are solving meaningful problems in the world, that we're not just simply inventing a new gadget or a trinket. You know, like some of the businesses I hate are the ones that are deliberately designed to waste people's time, deliberately <laughs> designed to... <laughs> so many of those. People. So many of those. Yeah. For me, that is the antithesis of what I want to be about as an entrepreneur. I, I want to use the tools of entrepreneurship. And I still, by the way, it still includes capitalism and it still includes success financially, but I want to use the tools of entrepreneurship to solve the world's most meaningful problems. I think that's actually, uh, that resonates very, very heavily with me. I mean, I, I had a very long career in technology and I had my own entrepreneurship career. I mean, I, uh, you know, I've co-founded more than 20 businesses, probably 25 or 27, I don't remember even money oh. anymore. Uh, and, and of course, you know the cycle, huh? I, when you say you're supposed to take risk, man, man, I took risks. Like, <laughs> yeah. as evident by the fact that, you know, a, a good 60%, 70% of them didn't succeed, right? So, but that's the whole idea. The whole idea is I didn't care. To me, it was that incredible urge inside me to, uh, to just try. To, to, to just do to it to bring something into the world yeah and yeah. you know and of course being in that space after a while most of my friends and co-workers and then eventually investors and others would come to me and say hey we should start this and i would go like yeah that doesn't make any difference to the world at all you know even by the way it doesn't have to be uh, uh, you know, a project like Unstressable, for example, which I'm working on now to try and take a million people mm. out of, uh, of stress every year. It could be as simple as, I mean, there was a point in time where I started the laundry business, okay? Uh, with, the, with the single objective of incre increasing the convenience uh, of the whole process, uh, because at the time, it was early years in Dubai, you had many, many single people who come here for work who are expatriates, who have a life that is, 
you know, that is very demanding in, on the outside world, don't have much time for themselves. And you a, know, a laundry business can be profound. Uh, uh, yeah. One of the most profound shifts in humanity was the invention of uh, automated laundry and yeah. automated like, the ability to take women out of the house where they were spending an, an amazing amount of time doing laundry. Um, <laughs> yeah. That was actually one of history's most profound yeah. uh, inventions. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, at, at the time, Dubai really had a very poor mapping system. So delivery was not, uh, you know, uh, was not really uh, viable in many ways. And what we were really doing was we were trying to solve the mapping system, not the laundry system. Ra laundry was the product. <laughs> but but once again, I mean, I, I just, I, I tell this, this story because I would say that I've never felt more at home uh, than the time where I actually joined Google. The early Google was all about solving big problems, right? We, we were even mm -hmm. instructed uh, you know, Larry used to call it the toothbrush test. You know, if it, if what you're doing is not going to solve a big problem that affects a billion people or more in a way that they appreciate so much that they do use it twice a day, then maybe you can put your time elsewhere, right? And and I think that Amazing. was really profound for me. It, you know, the idea of what I can even have the ability to dream to create the next toothbrush, if you think about it. Uh, was very empowering. And I think what you're saying is very much in line with that. It's the type of entrepreneurship I'm drawn to. I've been invited to be part of entrepreneurial ventures that are going to clearly make money, um, but they don't impact yeah. people's lives or they don't solve the world's most meaningful problems in any real way. And um, and for me, that's not a that's not an exciting problem. Yeah. So, so Daniel, I, I, when I introduced you, I basically told my listeners that we're coming up to a time where the definition of jobs and work uh, and income sources are being redefined so drastically. And that in my mind, uh, you know, entrepreneurship is a very viable approach to how we can move forward in the world. So rather than uh, be a graphic designer in a, in a creative agency, and now so much of the work is being handed, handed over to AI, uh, you might as well use your capabilities and art to do something for yourself. Um, mm. But we, you know, as we start the conversation, uh, we said there is that moment at age 10, uh, or, 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 you know, around that uh, young age or you, where you get an experience that makes you, that triggers you to be an entrepreneur. Does that mean that not everyone can be an entrepreneur? Well, I think of entrepreneurship as a team sport. Um, and I think there is, there's a, a certain person on the team called the founder um, who is really good at getting things started from a blank piece of paper. And not everyone is equally as good at being a founder but everyone can be part of an entrepreneurial team. Um, entrepreneurial teams, so if we think about an entrepreneurial team, it is that small, dynamic, um, inspired, visionary team of people who want to punch above their weight, who want to um, make a, a sacrifice together, who want to organize resources together, um, and who, you know, entrepreneurship is a team sport. It's, a, it's something that you can't do on your own. It's not self-employment. It's it's uh, it's this it's this thing, and a lot of the wealth that is created through entrepreneurship is not necessarily in the first one to five million. It's a lot of the time the wealth is created in the five to fifty million. Um, so there's still room to come in um, and be part of that entrepreneurial wealth creation. If you get in after the first day, you can you know plenty of people didn't join Google on day one and made plenty of money out of Google. Um, you know by being part of the scaling up of Google. Yeah. Um, and Google's obviously an extraordinary example, but on much smaller cases, um, you know, I've just literally been working on a deal where a new CEO is coming into an entrepreneurial venture. Um, the venture is going to be scaling from 10 to 100 million, and the new CEO is going to get a, a pretty significant um, share in the business and all of those sorts of things if the, if the success is there. So there's plenty of room to be part of this entrepreneurial team. Um, the, you know, the, the world is changing very rapidly and the new model of work isn't it's still up for grabs and so if we think about there's some there's some interesting parallels we go back through most of human history and almost all of human history is defined by a very small number of people who have everything and a very large number of people who have nothing so that is the default i would almost say that's the default setting for society because it's been if we take 10,000 year of sample size and we went and interviewed 
just random people from the last 10,000 years, it's almost exclusively the case that we would find peasants who work in fields for kings. Mm. Um, so, you know, essentially it's this massive wealth inequality and, um, you know, a very small group of elites and a very large group of people farming. And one of the reasons that that happened is because we lived in a society that was underpinned by um, automation. So the automation that we were underpinned by was called soil uh, or land. So you plant a small seed and the soil knows exactly what to do with that seed to turn it into a tree and yield fruit. And humans were only really required to plant seeds and pick fruit. Whoever owned the land became extraordinarily wealthy, but the people who were just putting in seeds and picking fruit uh, were not. Now, if we take AI, artificial intelligence, you put in a small prompt, you plant a seed, and out comes this incredible piece of fruit out of that land. <laughs> it yields this incredible thing of value. You only have to put in the tiniest seed and out comes a lot of fruit. And um, whoever owns that digital land is the new king, the new queen, the new duke, the new duchess. Um, so we actually have this new neo-feudalistic digital land that's being created. And we are actually moving at the moment by default towards uh, the default setting of a small group of very wealthy elites and a large group of people who work the land, although this time it's digital land. Um, we have people who are carving out a small plot on Amazon land, uh, selling some books. We have some people who are carving out a small plot on Google land. Um, you know, they've created some content. Um, and we have people who are, you know, carving out a little bit of AI um, land, uh, you know, by doing an AI startup. But ultimately, the vast majority of people are unaware of the impact of what's happening. There's a big change that's happening. Our jobs are being disrupted. And in many cases, people aren't aware of just how profoundly um, yeah. that, we're, that, we're, that we're going back to a world that looks a lot more like the last 10,000 years than the last 150 years. That is so profound. I never looked at it this way, but it's very, very true. I mean, when you when you think of automation from the beginning of time as land, as the machine that turned a seed into a crop, uh, then a yeah. factory, uh, the machine that turned raw materials into a product, and then a bank, you know, the machine that turned information and knowledge into pro profits and money. You know, it is quite an interesting way to look at AI now as the machine that will turn little seeds of prompts into massive, massive, massive products, but that the true wealth is in the person that owns the land. Uh, you know, it's it's with the person that owns the factory. It's with the person that owns the, the parallels. Bank. Yeah, yeah, the parallels are incredible because even the idea that it felt godly, it felt like it felt like a, a spiritual or godly experience to plant a seed and pick fruit. The fact that you had most people had no idea how on earth that seed became a tree and how that tree yielded fruit. No one no one could explain it. It was a completely mind-blowing process for all of human history. And we were at the whim of the gods. Yeah. And it feels like that with AI. It feels like it's a godly or spiritual experience to put in a prompt and out comes this incredible amount of content. Um, and it also feels like we're, at, we're currently at the, will of the, at the will of the gods, that the technology gods are now... Like the language that we're using, people in the AI community, the language that we use is very similar to the language that someone might have used when they didn't understand weather and they didn't understand uh, what affected crop yields and all of this sort of stuff. We don't know. Even people who work in AI don't really know how the AI produced the fruit. <laughs> it's just yeah. we plant the seed and out comes the fruit. Yeah. So, so does that mean we're doomed to be peasants? Well, we, we built and designed um, a different society through, um, look, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a capitalist, but I can absolutely acknowledge the role of things like unions, where unions um, organized labor and said, hey, we need to share this wealth more equally. Um, and otherwise, we'll shut down the factory. Otherwise, we won't play ball. Um, and unfortunately, it's not a particularly glamorous process or it's not a particularly desirable process, but it did yield a middle class. And there was someone someone somewhere designed the idea of what would society look like if we had this idea of a middle class. And this was a new invention. And when I call it an invention, 
someone invented it. Like it was not the default. For thousands of years, there was no middle class. There weren't middle class jobs. The, you know, the, the people who invented the industrial age, they didn't imagine workers having nice lives. They imagined workers being cheap labor. Um, <laughs> you know, they, and someone had to come along and invent better living standards and they had to invent a way of organizing ourselves to have a weekend and all of those kind of inventions that we had and we also had to get rid of child labor as recently as 19 early 1900s we had children working in mines and um you know children working in food production uh, in horrific conditions um but we had to invent rules to say hey we don't want to play by those rules we want to play by a different set of rules that actually uh create a life we want to we all want to enjoy so it was a human invention. I think that if humans could invent it once, we could probably invent it again. Um, and also if we could use AI to support that invention and say, uh, like, let's use AI as a tool and and really ask the AI, uh, how do we structure things so that um, so that we, you know, can deliberately create a vast majority of people uh, who, you know, who share in the, the benefits of this technology. Let's talk about the individual. So, so our listeners here, um, mm. you know, at a at a time where there are such profound disruptions, the, you know, new landlords and new godlike creativity. Things. What should one do? What should any of our listeners now, who may have never been entrepreneurs in their life, uh, who may feel threatened that they're going to lose their job, what should they do? Well. I really believe in being part of an entrepreneurial team and being part of a visionary team. Um, I, I feel that you should move towards um, you should move towards a few things. You should move towards uh, inspiration. So if you feel inspired, um, one thing that I think a lot of people make as a mistake is they think that if they're inspired by a business idea, then they should go off and start that business idea. They should be a founder. And they confuse entrepreneurship with found, being a founder. Um, I think there are path, uh, there's a, a set of steps that are better steps. Um, so one of those steps is working on an entrepreneurial team. And an entrepreneurial team would be a team that's less than 50 people where you get to work closely with a founder mm. um, so that you're actually, you talked about the experience of working with Larry. Yeah. Like that is you know, that yeah. is, uh, that was a highlight of my life. Larry and Sergey, uh, you know, yeah. definitely a highlight. I mean, in, in many ways with, with sometimes with their quirks and mistakes, but, but was so close to their vision and their passion and mm. their drive was very, very inspiring actually. So if we take the word entrepreneurship and think of it almost as a literal ship, like a boat, Right. The first step is to step onto a boat of a, of someone who is a great, inspiring captain, someone who is a founder who's succeeding. My my story starts when I'm, you know, an entrepreneurial apprentice for a, a guy who's much older than I am. I'm I'm 19, he's 37, he's starting a business, he goes from zero to six million in the first year, and I get to be his apprentice, I get to work closely with him. And um, to me, that was where I got my entrepreneurial apprenticeship doing two years working for an entrepreneur. Um, there are, uh, in my company, there's been something like 12 different people who have worked for me and then gone off and started a multi-million dollar venture. Yeah. Um, so, you know, <laughs> they picked up their entrepreneurial apprenticeship and they're off doing something in the world. So um, if what, what should someone do? Move towards working closely with a founder who inspires you would be a step towards entrepreneurship. Move towards a more meaningful problem. If you have a feeling that your work is not meaningful if you're looking at the work that you do and you say this is just a this is just a nonsense job this is not a mm -hmm. i'm not solving a meaningful problem here i'm just you know i'm shuffling paper around desks i'm you know plugging things into a spreadsheet i'm um you know uh, do, doing work that just distracts people it's meaningless you got to move towards meaning you got to move towards speed uh, where things are happening fast and you want to move towards being part of a smaller, more dynamic entrepreneurial company um, that may end up putting you as a founder at one point in the future. But I wouldn't worry about that. For most people, correct. I wouldn't worry about starting a business. Yeah, correct. I mean, in, in a very interesting way, I think my uh, my most profitable, most rewarding uh, startup ever was Google. 
right? I didn't start it, honestly. I mean, I didn't start it. I didn't run it as the founder like I did with others. Uh, and I, and I never, re and I wasn't even in the first few thousand uh, people. But I, you know, I had a very uh, entrepreneurial role within Google as Google was maturing a little bit. So you know, I, I mm. came in and we had, uh, we had the, the UK, the US, the Japan, the big countries basically were established, creating I think at the time eight billion dollars a year, which of wow. course. Yeah, of course, when you really look back now at, you know, at what we built out of that, uh, you go like 8 billion was nothing, right? <laughs> but, but at the, <laughs> you know, we, you know when, we, when we were actually at that stage, we were like, okay, we're the biggest people on earth, like we, right? And, and my role was to build emerging markets. So I, I started to say, you know, I think the, the, the strategy at the time when I walked in was the next billion. Uh, so how can we create the next billion dollars? And I remember vividly one of those meetings where I said, I think it should be the next 4 billion. And then every one of the business leaders, my peers looked at me like, come on, man, that's our quota. And I was like, I think it should be the, four, the next 4 billion users, right? At the time, Google was yeah. basically, yeah. Uh, you know, I think we had a billion users around the world. That's it. Uh, in those big countries, you know, US, Japan, and so on and so forth. And that was creating the $8 billion. And I said, no, we need the next 4 billion users. Imagine even at a cheaper price of ads, uh, you know, the mm. kind of inventory that, I, and I, so I took that project and it was my project for seven years and it really did deliver. I mean, it, it really, I think n not only was my, f my favorite entrepreneurial work ever, but it was also, I think, the biggest impact I ever had, even bigger than the Google X years. I was going to say, isn't it incredible just that moment where you spoke up in that meeting and said, you know, I, I think it should be 4 billion users who yeah. we've overlooked. Yeah. And it was it was obviously that that put you on the radar of Larry and Sergey. Um, it was that one moment. It, it's funny, in, in the course of your life. You'll, that, be, you'll be surprised. I think you will be upset with me when I say that. The moment that really defined me at Google uh, was when we were at the very first sales conference. And my boss at the time was Nikesh, Nikesh Arora. And Nikesh was a harsh manager. He was an amazing teacher. He was super straight, right? Uh, but he was harsh. He pushed hard, okay? And so people feared him. And I have a, a brain defect, so I really saw the human in him. And I really never feared him. I adored him, right? Anyway, mm -hmm. we had the sales conference and Nikesh being so specific, you know, we were four regions reporting into him. I, I was tiny, like literally nothing. I think we were like a $12 million part of the business or something. And he said, okay, each of you gets 20 minutes on stage. You tell us about your region. And basically he said, you prepare your slides. You come 6 p.m. the day before you rehearse. I'll give you comments. You come again at 9 p.m. rehearse again. And then you wake up at 6 a.m. We're rehearsing at 7 a.m. And then the, the talk is at 10 or something wow. like that. Right? That's very much unlike me. I'm an entrepreneur. I, don't, I normally don't use slides at all. Uh, anyway, yeah. uh, I, I did exactly what he said and, you know, I dissected the $12 million, which like, you know, compared to region one, which was like $2 billion, who would listen to me? Anyway, somehow the first slide on the, on my, my presentation saying region four was a jungle because, you know, Africa was part of my region and, you know, parts of Latam where I was advising and so on. And and it was a foggy jungle. So it was basically sort of like the quest into the unknown. And somehow, because of my brain defect, I get on stage and instead of doing what we rehearsed three times, I have that slide and I go like, fuck it, I'm not gonna talk about the revenue. And I started to talk about the reality of what it's like to live in emerging markets when you don't have access to Google at all, wow. okay? And I could wow. see Nikesh, I'm not making this up. I could see Nikesh looking at me from the front row, waving his hand with the kill sign. I'm like, I'm going, I didn't know if he was saying, I'm going to kill you or, you know, uh, kill it and what leave, are you doing? right? Yeah. Anyway, I attempted to look the other way. And then the, uh, at the other seats, there was Larry, Sergey, and Eric Schmidt, our CEO at the time, who were so drawn in. Unlike yeah. when, what they, how they were when the revenue presentations were made. Yeah. 
And so anyway, Nikesh pressures me. So I finish in 18 minutes instead of 20. And as I'm now, you know, sort of going to collect my stuff and leave the company, that's my expectation from dis disobeying him. Larry, Sergey and Eric stand up and they clap for like, a, a, you know, a standing ovation of two, three minutes, the entire room, wow. 7,000 people at the time. And that completely shifted the company. The company was like, hold on, we're making enough money. It was still the years of don't be evil. And we were very driven by the mission. And I sort of started my conversation by the mission, which was organize the world's information and make it universally accessible mm. and useful. And I said, well, it's not accessible to, to more than, you know, 6 billion people around the world. So what are we going to do about that? Right. And yeah, one of, one of those moments where in, in a way it's when starting you, a company. When did you decide that you were going to change the speech? Uh, like when I held the clicker in my hand. <laughs> I know. I mean, think about it. You, you, just you, tapped, no, you, you were just tapped into something. You were tapped into an energy that um, I've had certain talks like that myself where I, I, gave a, I gave a speech, I changed it right there on the spot. And it was like almost a spiritual energy was flowing where it's like there's there's a bigger game there's a bigger story to tell exactly yeah i mean you, you said it you said it if if you didn't have purpose you you don't want to do this so so i i left microsoft to go to google even though my intention was to retire after microsoft so literally i got the call from google eight months before my set retirement date okay and mm -hmm. i said i'm going to go to make a difference and then suddenly I'm sitting there talking about growing the business from $12 million to 14. That didn't, yeah. that didn't feel like what I stood for. Uh, so one of the things I wrote about in, in my book, uh, Entrepreneur Revolution, was that the entrepreneur has three brains. And it's, it's loosely based on the three brain model, which is a massively oversimplified. That's such an interesting way, yeah. It, it's, it's an oversimplified model, but I have personally seen it, witnessed it, felt it myself, that I do have three brains and everyone I work with, with has got three brains. So I talk about the reptile, which is this um, fight, flight, freeze, and it just basically wants uh, sex and food, entertainment and revenge. And it's, <laughs> it's like yeah. these, are the <laughs> these, these are the main things that, that it really loves. And, um, and it's not very good at entrepreneurship. It's not good at entrepreneurship at all. Uh, and then the, the middle part of the brain, which was your manager, wants to complete tasks and get rewards. That's it. It's like, it's the autopilot. And the autopilot, it just craves this idea of like, um, complete the task and get a reward. And that's what your manager is sitting in the audience representing that part of the brain, which is like, oh my goodness, this is off task. This is like not completing a task and getting a reward. Interesting. I'm not sure. I'm yeah. not sure what the dopamine loop would be on this, right? Yeah. So it's like, you're doing something that's different. And then there's this next higher level part of the brain, which is where everything comes from, which is the visionary. And it wants to improve the world. And it mm. wants to do something of great meaning and inspiration and passion. And at a very much, a, I think there was a study in India about farmers who received their annual pay in one lump sum. And then by the end of the year, they were completely out of money and they were down to survival. And they actually did IQ tests and discovered that when people had an abundance of money, they had a standard deviation higher IQ. And when they were completely in scarcity, they had a standard deviation lower in IQ. Oh, wow. And yeah. <clears throat> so our ability to problem solve, if we're, if, we're, if we're in reptile mode, we are a standard deviation lower IQ. And if we are in this uh, different mode, now, one of the reasons that we get into this uh, higher mind is not through uh, pleasure or dopamine and rewards and all this sort of stuff. It's by selecting a big problem. So the mm. way that we engage that part of the brain is by literally thinking about a problem like how do you get 6 billion people to have access to the world's information um, how do we how do we create accessibility to, to billions of people for this technology? So when you give your brain a problem that's that big, the reptile brain says, no idea. I'll just sit on the sidelines. <laughs> that's, that's not uh, sex, food, and entertainment. I, I don't know about that. There's no revenge in that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, the, the, the autopilot says, I don't know how the dopamine reward loop works with this. I don't know what tasks to complete. I don't know what I get rewarded for just yet. So I'll just sit on the sidelines, but the visionary opens up and says, God, how would I do that? How would that happen? Who would I have to connect with? Who would I need to pitch? Who would I, what resources already exist that we could reorganize to get that done? So it's only through taking, it's only through the deliberate pursuit of a massive problem that we can open up the best parts of ourselves. That, that, this is so profound, actually, not even in business only. I think the idea of uh, uh, th that the higher brain is where the compassion, where the, you know, love for others that drives you to make a difference exists is actually something that really requires reflecting upon. Because when I speak about artificial intelligence, I sort of say that, um, you know, my confidence is that the more intelligent those machines will become, uh, the more they will align with those values. Because you can easily see that the smartest of all of us don't want to destroy the planet for profits, right? It's, you know, you have to be dumb in the middle in that execution uh, brain of tasks and reward. Uh, you know, in order to be able to tell yourself, okay, I'm going to build a project and market it and advertise it and it's going to destroy the planet and waste people's time and, and lives, but it's going to make me money because that's task and reward, which is quite eye-opening, yeah. actually. I think it, it really describes the problem of our world today. It's the manager mind, the autopilot mind, that would chop down every forest in order to manufacture more paper clips. Um, yeah. you know, if that's the task, if that's what I've been told to do, then I'll go and do that. I'll, I'm, I'm only single-mindedly focused on that. That's, that's the part of AI we do need to fear, I think. Mm. Um, but if we can transcend that and we can say, what are the world's most meaningful problems? Um, you know, I share all of your fears around AI, but I also have, um, there's, there's a couple of things that I do feel positive about. Growing up in Australia, I was guaranteed education and I was guaranteed healthcare and I was guaranteed infrastructure. So uh, born in 1981 in, in Australia, you there was never even a question that you wouldn't go to a great school, that you wouldn't be able to go to a great hospital, um, and that the police, the education system, the legal system, all of that stuff just worked. There was not like that was just the backdrop of every Australian's yeah. life that we it just was never even a question. Um, and what I do hope for artificial intelligence is that billions of people who don't currently have healthcare, uh, education, and like legal systems and all that sort of stuff that suddenly and very rapidly they get the onset of those things, mm. that they have effectively one of the world's best general practitioners in their pocket, they have one of the world's best psychologists in their pocket, they have one of the world's best architects, engineers, uh, you know, computer developers, um, that they have uh, healthcare, education and legal system pretty much ready to go in the pocket um, to discuss issues, to, to basically create a new backdrop for one to two to three billion people who don't have those things in even a small measure um you know and and hopefully that is one of the greatest things that ai does do that it gives that that australian the the, the australian upbringing i had that it brings some of that backdrop to to people who don't have that backdrop which i have to believe believe is possible as a matter of fact you know when i speak about ai uh it's I celebrate that. I, 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 I openly say that this is uh, the upside, but I, you know, my, for me, it's, it's, the, it's the bad humans that will try to abuse that, that is my, uh, my fear. You know, I, I always say openly that, uh, uh, by the way, if any of our listeners have not listened to some of my conversations on AI, uh, go, 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 yeah. <laughs> go to YouTube and yeah. listen for, uh, you know, search for Mogo that is. The emergency meeting that you did with Stephen Barlow was great. Yeah, the, yeah, the emergency uh, meeting actually got uh, upwards of 7 million uh, listeners so that far. Was so. That was that was just an Im Im immensely useful conversation. Yeah, I think it's important that everyone gets updated on the topic. So please go ahead and do that. Uh, but yes, you're also right there, I, I think, uh, uh, Daniel, that we 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 have such a potential for a utopian world uh, and you know and it is very very possible if we mitigate 
uh, the systemic error, as I call it, the systemic error of that uh, that monkey execution brain in the middle that just wants to get the tasks done within the system, and then now they can do them two thousand times faster and soon twenty thousand exactly. times faster. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's where we need to be careful. The the other thing that I'm worried about is the neo-feudalism. Neo-feudalism or feudalism was basically the system of having kings, queens, dukes, and earls, uh, and then peasants, plebs, um, and soldiers and fodder, you, you know, dispendable, you know, completely, um, you know, dispendable humans. Um, so essentially a very, very, very ultra unequal society. And it was built on automation. It was built on the fact that everything was automated. Everything of value came from the land, and that was a completely automated process. So um, for me, I draw a very clear parallel that AI being digital soil will make the digital landowners extremely wealthy. Correct. Um, and, and everyone else will become plebs and serfs. So um, that is a that's a concern for me. Um, one of the things that should be a concern for the wealthy, the very ultra rich, is that eventually people rise up. Um, in the in the deck of cards, they encoded um, rules for how society should work and should be governed. And um, there's a lot of coding in in the standard deck of cards. But one of the things that they encoded was that the ones could become elevens. Um, that an ace is either a one or an eleven, and essentially the ace represents the bottom tier of society. And when it's when it's um, oppressed, it overthrows the king. Uh, mm -hmm. It is more powerful than the king. It basically the ones become elevens. The pitchforks come. The revolution comes. Um, and they built that into they built that into the deck of cards. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of symbolism enc encoded in there. But that is one thing that every wealthy person who's who's secretly saying, "Wow, this is pretty incredible. I'm just making a hundred million dollars out of uh, AI technology right now," should also be thinking, "Well, actually, let's not turn those ones into elevens. Let's not uh, take society and oppress it to the point where they feel the need to overthrow. If we can actually build a society that works for everyone, as entrepreneurs, we have markets. We have wealthy markets. We want to. We want markets to sell to. We want people to have money to spend." Um, we want people to feel happy in their lives so that they can work and produce great work and that they can, um, you know, be part of our businesses in more than ways than one. So we have to kind of get deliberate around how we want to build society. It, it, it puzzles me the meaning of the word wealth. Uh, and maybe, I, again, I, I have quite a few brain defects, but this is a prominent one within it because I've lived a very wealthy life that I've given up on completely because it bugged me because I did I, I really didn't enjoy it at all right and and in a in a in a way if I if you really deeply understand what's about to happen we are about to shift the manufacturing method of wealth in the world from scarcity to abundance right so so when when Everything that we've created as humanity has been a product of our intelligence. Every problem we've created has been a problem of our limited intelligence, if you want. And our limited intelligence is what abused others, abused the planet resources in order to create that wealth. You know, uh, it's the mentality of if I need to protect my village, I need to kill the tiger. And, and in, a, in a very interesting way, you know, if you have enough intelligence, you can create more tigers and just give them enough food so that the village is protected anyway. And, and I think because of the abundance of intelligence that comes with AI, we could literally have a world of abundance. I mean, I, I, I joke about this. I don't joke, actually. I think it's a, it's a very near future, but I sort of shock about this by saying that if we figured out nanophysics a little more than where we are today, uh, you know, it wouldn't be too far in the future where you could walk to a tree and get, a, you know, um, um, harvest an apple and walk to another tree and harvest an iPhone. Right. And be, literally from a tech point of view, the cost of reorganizing particles to create an iPhone is exactly the same as creating an Apple. Right. But somehow those with wealth and power don't understand that they they still compete for for wealth, for that segregation of power. It almost feels that if I have everything hmm, that's still not good enough, if others have it, too. 
right? It seems that the, 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 the battle for wealth and power is I should have what others don't have. Otherwise, I don't feel good about my wealth. And that's ego at its, at its very uh, core, really. And I don't understand why that is, because, you know, in my lovely little apartment, uh, which surely is not the kind of apartment that the, you know, uh, former chief business officer of Google X should be living in. Yeah, I, I love that. Often I get camera crews here and they go like, oh, we expected you to live in a mansion. And I'm like, it is a mansion. I love it in every possible way, right? And, and I, you know, the, the reality is in my mind, I'm completely confused. Like, why would I need more than that? It takes more effort to clean it. You know, you start to walk longer distances. You, you, you know, it, 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 is, it consumes more power unnecessarily. It's, it's, it's a strange, humans are a strange creature. We, one of the happiest times most people can relate to is when they have nothing. Um, when I say nothing, I mean you have your basic needs. Context. Yeah, you know, like here's the thing: I get interviewed all the time on podcasts, and they always want to ask the question about how did you get started, and they want to talk about like the very beginning of sleeping on a mattress on the floor, and like um, you know, if I take myself back to the time of having absolutely nothing materially. It was an amazing adventure. It was an incredible time. So, you know, there were there were times where, you know, I was delivering, I was a pizza delivery driver because I wanted to be able to get free pizzas. And, <laughs> um, and I, you know, that was a major perk for the job. And, you know, I was living five people in a three-bedroom house and we would stay up all night drinking and we'd do crazy, you know, go out to nightclubs that were on the other side of town so simply because they had slightly cheaper drinks and all sorts of things like this at the early stage. Um, when you look at what happens when you become, you know, wildly wealthy, a lot of your life is built around segregation. Yeah. You build, you know, if you, if most of my very wealthy friends, <clears throat> you know, they live behind gated communities. They live on the very top floor of buildings that are also protected around the building. Um, they, you know, they have security teams. They make sure that they travel in cars that are definitely not public transport. Um, you know, they, they fly private. Uh, they, um, they will spend a fortune on a yacht that parks 50 meters offshore of a beach where they are <laughs> essentially everyone on the beach is having a connected experience sharing the beach with others and then they're having a uh, segregated experience on the on the yacht so there's something strange about this like desire for segregation or status but it's not really linked to happiness it's not really linked to fulfillment because you know, you you take the happiest times. You're probably at a festival with people in a concert scenario. You probably you're you're deeply connected with others in the happiest times of your life. And when you're isolated and segregated, you're probably feeling unhappy, even even if you are on a yacht, even if you are um, mostly mostly unhappy. I mean, you'll be amazed how many billionaires desperately call for my help on happiness. It is. It is, I mean, I, if you take ratio, like percentage of billionaires that are miserable as, you know, as compared to percentage of normal humans that are miserable, as compared to percentage of poor humans that are miserable, mm. you'll, be, you'll be blown away. It seems that as soon as you get your basic needs met, the typical Latin American a coffee bean collector, right? I, I, I had this incredible woman. I, I worked on a Colombia coffee farm for uh, a few days and, you know, grueling work, grueling work because, you know, Colombian coffee farms are on mountains mm. and you have to carry like all of those kilograms and you could take them up to the uh, storage place. And it's just a, a, a difficult job and you do that eight hours a day. And she's 64. Mm. She looks like wow. 27, honestly. Like she's wow. so young and so uh, clearly healthy and, and happy. Huh? And, and I asked her and I said, how long have you done that for? And she said, I started when I was 16 until 60, 64. And I mm -hmm. said, are you happy? She said, I'm the happiest person on earth. And I said, <laughs> how come? And she said, I have nature. I have, I'm surrounded by people that love me. I have all the food I need and I have time for myself and the people I love. What else do you want? Yeah. Right? So, yeah. so th th that, uh, you know, as compared to the billionaire that's looking at the, next, the yacht next to him and saying, why is yeah. this two feet longer? 
it's, yeah. it's, it's just it's staggering how human it, humanity is. Yeah, and most people don't recognize that this does happen for billionaires. Um, one of the very hard things for billionaires is the wall that they have to build emotionally um, with the world. So when a billionaire scrolls through their Twitter or their Facebook feed, they see all these problems that they could theoretically solve in a phone call. So you see you see problems or issues. As a normal human being, you see problems or issues as just news events that you have no ability to solve, no ability to impact. And you just, like, if you see some someone starving or someone who's in, in trouble, you go, that's horrible, but I, I can't do anything about it. But for, for someone who's a billionaire, you look at that stuff and it's constant and you go, I could do something and I'm choosing not to. Um, Interesting. So there's this kind of, there's this kind of like emotional barrier or emotional wall you have to build um, if you're, if you are so resource rich, which, you know, is part of this isolation. Um, I met some of the happiest people in Uganda, in rural Uganda. Um, I met an amazing entrepreneur, a woman who, she was picking trash off of uh, a trash heap and her children, a couple of her children had died and a couple of her children were with her. And then an aid agency said she could get a micro loan of $50 to go and buy some chickens and breed the chickens and that they would set her up. So she became a chicken breeder and then she got up to 400 chickens. She traded some of her chickens for two goats and she became a goat breeder. And then she traded some of her goats for pigs and she became a pig breeder. And when I met her, she she said, this is my farm. These are my chickens, my pigs, my goats. Um, that's my cow, right? And she she had the energy of Rupert Murdoch <laughs> saying, this is my global empire of newspapers, mm. right? She had this energy of like, this. look what I've achieved. I've gone from nothing to having this. And she was supporting her village around her. And she was just this powerhouse um, you know, this amazing woman who had who had basically entrepreneured her way into this, you know, this um, position of influence within her community, and she was an employer and uh, someone who could feed the people around her. It was am amazing to amazing. see. Amazing, and with a fifty dollars loan, it was a fifty dollar micro loan followed by a hundred and fifty dollar micro loan followed by a three hundred dollar micro loan, and then she paid it all back, and she she had um, transformed her life and the life of her community for about. For about a revolving line of credit of five hundred bucks. Yeah, <laughs> don't don't get me started. I will now shout and scream because you know how many of us would go and spend those fifty dollars on another pair of shoes or whatever that they don't really need. And you know, if you, it, it, it 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 again staggers me I, because, like you, I know many billionaires that. Uh, in in reality, if they drop fifty dollars, they would literally not look at it. Okay, uh, you know, yeah. if they if they drop five thousand dollars, they would not look well, at there it. There becomes a there becomes a point where it's not worth returning things that you're not going to use because it's not worth your time to put them back in a box and send them back to wherever they came from. Yeah, um, I'm I'm almost in that category now where I buy I I bought some shirts that don't fit me right. And, you know, they're $100 per shirt or like a little bit more. And I just had the thought of like, oh, now I have to go to return them. It's my time. It's not worth my time to return these. Mm -hmm. And it's like a weird thought of like, how stupid is that? How, how strange that I'm probably not going to return these. I'll just put them. I push myself into a very clear experiment when I, you know, not unfortunately, not all coffee shops that I go to allow you to tip the barista. But if they do, I will buy, I will give what is equivalent to the coffee I bought, okay? And, and I will tell myself, you know, if, if I had dropped my coffee, they would have given me another one for free. So I might as well give them the free one, uh, you know, and as, as, as if I dropped my coffee or something like that, right? And in a very interesting way, you know, when I go and buy a sandwich and it's, you know, five dollars or three dollars. I will say I will try to tip a five dollars or three dollars. Okay, mm. and 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 it's a practice because even I uh, would go like, yeah, but five dollars for a coffee to tip the barista is too high. They don't expect that. They expect a couple of coins. But in my mind, five dollars for me, if I desired another coffee, I would have immediately got up and and bought it. it would I wouldn't think twice. Annoying. Okay, and 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 in a way. It gives me more joy to give them the five dollars than it actually mm. does for me to buy another coffee.
and and I I don't understand again why humans don't. Oh, there's do there's that. incredible joy in that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you know what we need? We need tip the farmer. We need uh, yeah. to have something where. You, imagine imagine this. Imagine there's some sort of a video screen portal, and it actually shows you where the farming and the beans are happening. And you can just tip the farmer and you say, hey, look, we'll put an extra five. Because five dollars to a to a farmer in Kenya is <laughs> transformational. We should tip the we should have a way of tipping the farmers. It it's we should have a way of literally tipping each other what we don't need. I mean, in a in a very interesting way. Yesterday I was on a podcast, Prof G, and and he uh, was asking me about what the 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 you know oligarchs of, of AI should do if you, you know, if we were to change the world. And I was saying, I mean, with all due respect, of course, uh, Elon Musk has had a very negative view on AI for quite a bit of time. And he speaks about the, the you know, existential threats for such a long time. And we all know that there is really almost zero, less than three, four percent of control code in AI. We have no control of what, over what we're coding uh, whatsoever. And you know, if Elon Musk puts $3 billion into uh, ensuring that there is AI control code, he could literally save the planet, okay? And yet $3 billion, of course, is a very large number of, you know, amount of money for most of us, but for Elon, it's, you know, 6% um, of his wealth or something like that, okay? Uh, one and a half percent mm. of his wealth. So, so it's, you know, it's not a big deal. Hmm? And, and when you really think about it, there is always that barrier of, no, no, I'm going to keep my coffee, but I'm not going to give a, a $5, to the, you know, of, of coffee to the other person. There, there has to be, we have to get past relying on, on benevolent oligarchs um, because that doesn't end well, and and that's never that's never been a recipe for society. Yeah. So we're in in the time in ten thousand years of um, feudalist uh, structures, there was never really a situation where a massive oligarch, you know, gave up all their wealth and power and just simply distributed amongst their people. Um, these things just don't happen. What like some of the things that do have to happen is we need to say well. If a lot of value is created from language models and data, we need to tax the data. So data I, yeah, usage, you know, so like, for example, because here's what oligarchs need. Oligarchs need a level playing field. If one oligarch says, I'm going to give all my wealth away or I'm going to I'm going to play by a different set of rules, they know deep down that the other oligarchs who don't play by those rules will eventually overtake them and buy Correct. their company and take them over and all this sort of stuff. So they, I mean, people... People have these kind of very juvenile views of what it's like to be extremely wealthy, but for the extremely wealthy, they have massively wealthy rivals. Look at Elon and Mark Zuckerberg fighting it out at the moment over you know hundreds of millions of people's accounts and billions of dollars worth of value. You know these guys are physically going to step into the cage together and fight it out. You know so the rivalries are real. So if you say to Elon, well, hey, Elon, why don't you just give away your money here? He's sitting there going, because Mark Zuckerberg will take over and he'll he'll then annihilate me. And that's how he might describe it and how it might feel for him. What we need is a level playing field where the role of government, you know, we've so lost our way where what what is government for and all of this sort of stuff. But if we can create systems that work and systems that um move money around it's good for everyone it's even good for the oligarchs it's good for the entrepreneurs you don't want to live in a society where there is no middle class who can buy things you don't want to live in a society that doesn't have an educated work population you know you want to live in a society where there is a good symbiotic relationship between markets and entrepreneurs um, and value you know the, those those things are equally matched and equally balanced um because it's no fun just sitting on a mega yacht by yourself, uh, <laughs> watching the world burn. Mm -hmm. um, you know that's not that's not the joy that anyone wants to aspire to. Yeah, I think I think we should instruct uh, part of the government reform is that every uh, billionaire should have at least forty minutes of silent meditation every day, where they reflect on what they're doing with their life. <laughs> uh, you'll be amazed how, how I Mi change. the Ministry of Meditation. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I normally so I'm, I'm about to head at the end, at the beginning of August. I'm about to head into a uh, uh, this year, unfortunately, only twenty five days of a silent retreat. Uh, but I normally do forty, and and twenty five days of silence. 
I can guarantee you will give a lot of clarity about all of the shit I've done in my life. Like, you know, you, you sit there and in the first couple of days you hum Pink Floyd music, uh, you know, in the middle of the silence. And then eventually you stop and you go like, why did you do that? You know, why did you treat her that way? Why did she treat you that way? What, you know, and you start to, you know, eventually end up with the questions of why am I here? Have I done well on it? And, and these are good questions if you ask me. And, and I think people need to have more of that silence instead of uh, uh, more meetings to make another million dollars. I was actually expecting, Daniel, that we were going to talk about entrepreneurship, but man, man, those topics, it is an incredible conversation. Can, let, let, let me ask, to, you know, to, a couple of questions in, at the end of our conversation. So, so they say, and I have to admit, I believe that was true about myself every time I was an entrepreneur, that we have entrepreneurs, we have um, almost naive optimism. Uh, do you believe that to be true to start and, you know, what is here today to be optimistic about, not just for entrepreneurs, but for all of us? So it is actually still the greatest time in history to be an entrepreneur and to be part of an entrepreneurial team. The, there is more money on the planet than ever before looking for a home, looking for investment. Um, that's greater than any other time in history. The capital that you can raise is greater than at any other time in history, for even for an idea or a small business. Uh, secondly, the the ability to organize labor, the ability to form teams of the right people. It used to be that you could only form a team of people who were geographically close. Now you can form teams of ideological um, uh, com, you know, communities. Um, it used to be that you had to sell to people who were geographically close, and now you can sell to people all over the world. The market sizes have never been greater. Um, it used to be that it was very difficult to access the answers and, and to be able to get the knowledge. And now the knowledge is distributed so far and wide. It was very rare that someone could have a mentor conversation. And now you just go onto YouTube and there are mentor conversations. Um, so this is the greatest time in history to be an entrepreneur. The second thing is, is that entrepreneurs solve meaningful problems and we've never had a crisis of more meaningful problems that are, that are <laughs> yeah. washing up on the beach, yeah. right? So we have we have meaningful problems to solve. So the beauty is, is that right now, this is the greatest time in history to pick a meaningful problem and access and organize the resources to solve that uh, and to make a lot of money doing it, to become very wildly successful doing it. So this is this is great. The risk at the moment is that AI has two superpowers. Superpower number one is the ability to get you to overconsume, and superpower number two is the ability to get you to overcreate. So if you go onto your devices and you spend two hours doom scrolling through social media and you never intended to do that, then AI was able to successfully get you to overconsume. If you listen to music on Spotify, if you buy things on Amazon, that is the AI encouraging you to consume more than you intended. Um, however, if you go onto other websites and use AI to generate a business plan or to ideate some products or to come up with ways of communicating your ideas more effectively to, to people far and wide, then AI is powering your ability to create. Mm. And one of the biggest distinguishers right now is that there is almost a wedge that is going to be driven through society and half the people or a small, a large group of people are going to be on the side of over-consuming and they're going to feel miserable like, like force-fed animals. They're <laughs> going to be miserable um, because AI made them over-consume and there's going to be a small set, subsect of society who are going to be joyful that they are able to take small ideas and turn them into big ideas through AI. They're able to take the seeds of possibility and turn it into the promise of you know productivity and they're going to be be hyper creating with ai so one of the things that has to happen at this particular moment is that everyone has to make a deliberate and conscious decision to be on the cons uh, to be on the creation side of that wedge and to use ai as a tool for creativity and um and to deliberately carve out time in their day to say how am i going to interact with ai to solve them one of the world's most meaningful problems to organize people and resources and labor and capital to do something meaningful for the world? How do I play with AI for that objective? And how do I avoid overconsumption through AI? 
You said overconsume, overconsume. Sorry, overcreate. Uh, do, do you think there is a, an economic impact for the abundance of creation that's happening right now? So you know, it used to take uh, an artist several weeks to to create a work of art, and then you know, with digital tools, it became a day, became a day or two. But now it's basically a prompt. Uh, you know, someone like me, who's an author, who uh, took quite faster than the average author four and a half months to write any book once I put my mind to it. Uh, you know, um, it seems that I can create a book every 15 minutes now. So how does that impact society? You're speaking about the underlying economic model that has been in the background um, of our lives since, you know, the industrial age. So the industrial age is defined by the Adam Smith notion of demand and supply tension um and you know essentially that things that are in scarce supply become very valuable and profitable and things that are um in uh, you know a lot of supply become worthless uh the you know that's not the only economic model that's ever existed and that you know we've had many different economic models throughout history um and different ways of organizing society and essentially every time there's a major uplift or transformation in technology, we tend to come up with new economic models and new ways of organizing society. So, um, you know, the as I've said, the default here is that in a world where most things are automated, we end up with digital kings and queens and digital plebs and serfs. Um, but we can choose at this point in time to transform that. We can have an entrepreneur revolution where we teach people and we organize people around value creation um, and that we uh, pioneer different sorts of products and services. So, for example, people get an enormous amount of value going to something like Burning Man. They get an enormous amount of value going and doing a group golf day. They get an enormous amount of value um, going to concerts and hearing musicians uh, perform and all of these sorts of things. So there are types of things that give us enormous amounts of value that we're willing to pay for that are not necessarily about fulfilling our food and you know our survival needs. Um, where we are in society is we have to be asking the right questions rather than coming up with the right answers. We need to be thinking about what is the what is the future state society that we want to live in and how do we get there? Um, so every entrepreneur reverse engineers the future. That's what they do. We say, this is what we're trying to build and how do we get to it, All right? So we start with a vision. Uh, which a vision is just basically another way of saying what is it we're trying to create? What do we what do we see the world looking like? And then we say, all right, how do we reverse engineer that future? Most people are trained to forward engineer the past. They simply say, where am I now? Where have I been? And what's the next logical step? Uh, um, as opposed to where do I want to get to? And how do I reverse engineer that? That's so a beautiful, I, beautiful way to describe it, actually. And 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 quite uh, quite interesting as a mind shift for a lot of people. Not even in business only. I think the idea is that most of us are reactive to the past. You know, you go into a relationship, he breaks your heart, uh, you leave. You're now looking at the past and saying, "How do I not do that again in the future?" When in reality, you could say, "I want my future to look like this." I reverse engineer that. It means that I need to start from a person that looks like that. I need to take those following actions. That's a beautiful way to describe a way of life, honestly. And that is an entrepreneurial, that's one of the absolute commonalities with entrepreneurs. They mm. reverse engineer the future. Um, so we need to get into this as a discipline where we all say, okay, collectively, what do we want to reverse engineer as a future? And I don't mean that to say that we try and um, organize society in a socialist or communist kind of way at all. Um, I, I be believer in the in the um, invisible hand of the market and all of those sorts of things. But what I do believe is that we need to have a a, a north star, a vision, an entrepreneurial vision of what we believe the future should look like. And I don't think it should be uh, neo feudalism. I have to take notes when I'm talking to you. <laughs> So you speak of those things as if they are in our hands, and I, uh, I have to admit, sometimes I feel they're not because of that future digital kings and queens scenario, where perhaps you know. Uh, so, so I am very, very strongly optimistic about the power that the individual has over the machine itself. 
but not over, um, over the redistribution of wealth and power. Uh, I, I think humans, through their behavior, can influence the, the, the machine, the artificial intelligence machine. You know, you, every, each and every one of us can influence the Instagram uh, recommendation engine just by making the right choices of what we like and what we don't, right? But, uh, but none of us can influence the redistribution of wealth and power to meta uh, unless we all jointly decide that we're going to give up on threads. Things happen slowly, then they happen very, very quickly. Mm. Um, throughout all of history, there becomes a natural turning point where if too much wealth accumulates and too much power accumulates in one person's hands or one organization's hands, um, the tools of revolution come out. And, um, you know, when, when I'm talking to the wealthiest people that I know, I always say it's not a matter of if wealth will be re redistributed. It's just a matter of how. Um, because it always, like, you know, throughout all of history, eventually the pitchforks come out. Um, the ones turn into 11s, the aces go from the bottom of the pack to the top of the pack, um, and the game resets. There comes a point when you're playing Monopoly where it's not fun for the other players anymore. <laughs> I know. That one, I remember that one point. Person <laughs> has, one person has won. Clearly they've won. And everyone's landing on their hotels and their houses, and, and the game is no longer fun for the others. And what's interesting about that moment is that what almost always happens is that the people who are not having fun, they just stop playing. They get up and they leave. And, you know, this is the problem that people who want to accumulate even more wealth and power have. There eventually comes a point where either people stop playing or they tip the board over and they say, we're not playing this game this way anymore. We're starting the game again. So these are these are revolutions. <clears throat> wealth is like a mountain and there's there's water that lands on top of the mountain and trickles down the mountain through the rivers and the streams and it ends up in the lakes and the lakes are the big wealth creators the businesses the technologies um the things where money always ends up if you think about aws as a business it's a lake because all the other web businesses have to pay into that thing and then all the money ends up into the aws lake and google is a lake um so there needs to be a way to put the water back onto the mountain so it runs through the streams and the streams don't run dry. Um, and it still ends up in the lake, right? right? It still ends up back in the in there. But if you can keep this going, then the whole mountain flourishes. If you just hoard the money in the lake and then the rivers run dry, you know, and then everyone on the mountain is starving, this is not a way to, you know, this is desirable to nobody. This is not a desirable situation for anyone out there. So even the lake owner, right? Mm -hmm. So the beauty is, is that we just simply have to have an ecology, not an economy. We need to have an ecological approach where in an, in an ecology, things cycle. They cycle through and, th and everything thrives. You know, we end up with abundance because it's cycling, it's moving. In an economy, uh, we're trying to constrain, we're, we're imp imposing constraints. We end up with pools of wealth and capital that has nowhere to go and that's not desirable for wealth managers wealth managers want somewhere to put it we just have to have sensible ways to make sure that that ecology and that cycle keeps flowing beautiful metaphor uh and i and i and i i, I agree with you that the uh you said it several times the pitchforks will eventually come out uh perhaps not my favorite scenario but it seems inevitable yeah, but things can change very rapidly. Um, throughout all of history, for example, there was times in Britain where one person became extraordinarily wealthy and they introduced a 99% wealth tax. And that wasn't that long ago. Um, uh, it was the Duke of Wellington. The Duke of Wellington, um, uh, I actually know his descendants. And they said that uh, the Duke of Wellington was the wealthiest person in the world at the time. And then they put a 99% wealth tax tax in and uh, and just in one generation boom they redistributed the whole thing so throughout all of history there are peaceful ways of transferring wealth um there are all sorts of ways of transferring wealth that don't involve violence or revolution um and also that are good for people that are good for you know that fit with our values mm -hmm. for example it fits with most wealthy people's values the idea of meritocracy and earning it um and simply just passing on 
truckloads of wealth to the next generation, the next generation, the next generation who didn't earn it. And it actually makes them miserable. And they end up with drug addictions and gambling habits and all this sort of stuff. This is of no one's benefit either. Um, so, you know, there are certain ways that, that the game can be fun for everyone to play and win. We don't want to have a situation where, you know, we all end up you know, I don't think universal basic income is going to make people happy either. The idea that you just get money for nothing um, and there's no struggle and there's no creativity. I don't think that's the answer, but I think we, I, I think we're smart enough to come up with a society that works. I would hope so. So when you talk about the, 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 the game being fun, uh, let me close with this one question because I actually think we have spoken about so much that I will invite my listeners to go back and listen to this and take notes because believe it or not, everyone listening, I will listen back to this and take notes. Uh, you may have seen me scribble with my phone a few times because there are some very profound ideas that were shared here. Um, uh, so, so fun making the game fun. So you, you, Daniel, you spoke about purpose and you said that you tend to see yourself as someone who used the uh, method of entrepreneurship to solve meaningful problems. What is happiness to you? Uh, well, happiness has different levels. Um, there's the happiness that I have in having a family and passing on, passing on um, the gift of life uh you know to 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 family um and to raising raising family there's the happiness of uh, work where i'm doing meaningful work and i'm enjoying meaningful work um there's the happiness of struggle right where i've engaged myself in 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 hard problems and i feel that I, it may work out or it may not work out and that um in some way i am going to do things or take actions that could tip the balance between things working out or not working out. Um, so there's this kind of like enjoyable, meaningful struggle. Um, and, you know, all of that fits kind of my tapestry of happiness. Uh, you know, what what is happiness? Um, and then also there's the happiness of knowing that I'm not the main character in the world, um, that actually I'm just part of the tapestry. Uh, three generations, four generations from now, no one at all will know me or remember me or have any of, of that. Um, and three steps removed from my circles, no one cares. And um, there's actually a, a great profound joy and happiness and release in knowing that I'm just part of a tapestry, that, that we are all part of this incredible um, uh, intertwined, you know, game uh, or soup or tapestry that we are all stitched together somehow and that and that actually we're you know through time and space we all just blend into one <laughs> i i just i just posted about that literally last week to, to, to say that you're not the star of the movie it's quite interesting that you bring that up why, why does that make you happy does it is it because it takes the responsibility off your shoulders you know like this is, i'm i'm not the the, the 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 main character here that, that that means i don't have to solve everything or is it because you don't want to be in the spotlight why does it make you happy one of the most profound moments of my life when I was in my mid twenties, I was making a million dollars a month worth of sales, and I was I was the king of the kids. I was paying for everyone to go everywhere. I I would hire out areas of nightclubs and restaurants, and um, you know I had a uh, I had all the things right. All the the I had a cool car and a cool girlfriend, and um, and her, her friends were this amazing set of you know great girls and we you know sailing adventures and all this sort of stuff and i'm thinking of myself as just the the star of the movie right i'm definitely the star of the movie at that point in my mind and um i was dealing with all this stuff and i remember this one time flying out of brisbane and i'm on a plane and i look down and there's this football match and there's these um people kicking a football around and I can't see the ball, but I can see them moving towards the ball. And I can imagine where the ball must be because of how they're moving. Mm. And I think to myself, isn't it hilarious to those stupid little dots that football is important and meaningful. I can't even see it, but that is the focus of their life right now. And then I look at the audience, the, the uh, arena of all the spectators and I go, isn't it hilarious to those stupid little dots that they're focused on these people who are focused on a ball that I can't even see. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So then I'm I, I'm just kind of looking at this scenario. 
And then I can see all the cars driving around the city. And I think to myself, isn't it fascinating? All these little dots living out their dot lives um, in their little dot cars. <laughs> and like they're comparing their dot car to someone else's dot car. And and I'm like looking at, I look at the whole of Brisbane city and I think, isn't that hilarious? I don't know why I had this thought, but I remember thinking they've all got a coffee table and on the coffee table, there's a book or a magazine and they all like to them, that's an important thing. And isn't it hilarious that in the, all those houses, they're just living out these dot lives. I have no idea what they do to them. It's important to them. It's, it's meaningful. And I'm looking at society in this way. And then it hits me, this profound thing happened. I realized that if any of them looked up into the sky, they would see a red dot and a green dot on the wings. <laughs> and inside that little tiny metal tube is 150 little dots living out their life. And then all of a sudden it hit me, oh, my God, I am just a dot. <laughs> I'm just a dot. And I'm just a dot. <laughs> and I went, Phew. now it must have only lasted for three seconds. But for three seconds, I completely felt that I was part of the soup. I felt like I was part of the tapestry, that all of my significance, all of my main characterness, all of my ego melted away. And I had an experience of what it feels like to just blend into the soup or the tapestry of society and to be part like, like one with, with it. And I fell backwards into it. And it was this moment and I tasted something that felt incredibly powerful. It felt so overwhelmingly important that it was like this just glimpse into a different way. Here I was running in this direction, trying to be the main character, and actually it was completely eclipsed by the feeling of being just a dot. Yeah, and, and it is so profound when you recognize that all of the intricacies of our little lives when you really, really zoom out, you turn out to be that one pixel that interestingly completes the canvas. So without that one pixel, there is the art is destroyed, but, but it's not what's within the pixel and how the carbon atoms are organized. It's that one pixel that you are that makes this whole thing stick, you know, stitch together and become something that's so beautiful. I love you, man. I think uh, I, I get tons of guests here and we have amazing conversations. Uh, my favorite conversations are the ones where I tell myself, I'm gonna have to really think deeply about what he said here. Uh, I'm gonna have to think deeply about being that one dot in the canvas, which is uh, beautifully described by you, but uh, you know, said in a way that's, that's really an amazing reminder. I, I, uh, you know, the idea of solving meaningful problems, I think is, is gonna stick with me for quite a bit of time. Uh, knowing why I live my life the way I live it. But you taught me so many things about AI, believe it or not, uh, being the sort of authority figure on the topic, speaking to millions uh, every other week on the topic. Uh, you opened my mind to so much today, Daniel. I am so grateful for your time. Uh, I'm sure you'll open the minds of our listeners as well. And I love the diversity of your view on life. It's incredible. Really grateful no, that you joined me today. It's been an amazing experience. Thank you for having me. And for all of you listening, I hope, no, I, I think you must have enjoyed this as much as I did. I, once again, this is one of those conversations where there are those profound moments where you may think this was just another sentence, but if you go back and dig deep at some of those sentences, there is a whole book to be thought through. Uh, I'm planning to do that. I encourage you to go back and listen to this one more time uh, and understand the profound shifts that are happening in our society and how the past of our soil-based land compares to our future of the digital land and how that impacts on every one of us and how optimism and commitment to doing meaningful things can change everything. Uh, I am very, very grateful for all of you to give me the opportunity to invite uh, amazing, amazing thinkers on this podcast and have those conversations. It's all because you keep supporting me. Uh, so please do it. Uh, keep supporting this podcast. Uh, rate it five stars. Uh, tell people about it. Share it on your social media. Uh, don't leave the expansion of this uh, and the reach of those messages up to me. Uh, you can contribute to that. And I'm really, really grateful when you do. 
remember as well that there are times in our life where a little bit of silence and a little bit of space, a little bit of slowing down really gives you uh, an opportunity to reflect on things that can take you very far. Uh, so it doesn't matter how busy you are this week. Please, please, please take a little bit of time to slow down. I love you all for listening and I will see you next time.